following message is a presentation of Valley Metro Church, a community of believers dedicated to knowing God and making Him known. But the followers of Jesus were committed to learning from Jesus. But here's the deal. They weren't committed to learn about Jesus just for the sake of learning. The reason that anybody would come under uh, the discipleship or the following the master, the teacher, as Jesus was, the rabbi, the Lord, the Messiah, the Savior, in that culture, the reason you followed and learned was so that you can imitate. That was the aim. The aim was to imitate. They saw Jesus and they said, wow, you are the way, the truth, and the life. We want to follow and we want to imitate. And Jesus said, you will. (laughs) I'm going to the Father. I'm going to send you my spirit. And it's going to be tag. You're it. You're going to get to go and do what I've shown you. Whatever I've shown you, you do. And in fact, he said, you guys are going to do even greater things than I've done collectively, the church, all the people of God globally, go and go. I'm sending you. I'm commissioning you. Go. It's part of being a follower of Jesus. And today I want to talk to you about going. I want to talk to you about going public. Now, some of you understand when it comes to this great commission, the Bible's talking about going public. Part of our obligation, our responsibility is to step out and to proclaim the love that we believe. Uh, it's not to beat anyone up, it's to step up and to be able to, 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 to kind of come out. And I want to say this morning that some of you, some of you, God is telling you, come out, come out. There are some here that your faith is in the closet and God is saying, come out of the closet. You love me, God would say. I'm the answer to the universe. I am the king of all kings, of the Lord of your life. I love you. I'm your heavenly father. I adopted you as sons and daughters. Would you come out, please? Because a faith that powerful and explosive doesn't belong in a closet. If you have the view that my faith is my private thing over here and then the rest is my job and then I don't mix this with that and you get all categorical in your life, that might be your style. That's not the heart of God. God is calling us to come out, to live as representatives, to live as ambassadors, to live as the sons of daughters that we are, to simply live the way he's calling us to be. It's already who you are. If Jesus is the Lord of your life, then you are an adopted son and daughter of the Most High God with the privilege and the benefits of a citizen of God's kingdom with a hope and a future and insight and perspective and and you're in this whole different zone. God's simply saying, would you live like that? Would just be who you are. Don't pretend that you're not. And so I believe God is calling us out. He's calling us in a season to go public. Um, and I want to talk to you about going public today. I want to talk to you about how you and I as followers of Jesus, the resurrected Messiah, how you and I, how we learn and we follow him, but then we imitate him. And part of the things that Jesus came to do in his own words, the Son of Man came to redeem that which was lost. He was all about redemption. Still today, Jesus is all about redemption. Last week, we talked about the world is in a broken state and everything that Jesus touches gets redeemed. And that's cool. And you look at him as, he, as you read the, uh, the narratives through the New Testament and the Gospels and Jesus is walking down the dusty roads and wherever his feet bring him, boom, redemption, boom, redemption, boom, redemption. Whether it's somebody who's not in their right mind, boom, it's redeemed. He's in his right mind. Or someone who's sick, boom, you're redeemed. Or somebody who's completely lost, everywhere he goes, there's redemption and he's all about redemption. And now he's saying, tag, you're it. You are the messengers now, me and you, of his redemptive story. It goes beyond saying, I'm just the believer and it's private. No, tag, you are it. This is part of the abundant life. See, we talked about the analogy of of the Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea. The Sea of Galilee thriving with life and the Dead Sea being completely dead, no life in it. And the difference with these two bodies of water that both come from the same source, the difference being one has life flowing in and life flowing out and therefore it thrives. Sea of Galilee. 
The Dead Sea has life flowing in, nothing flowing out, and therefore everything in that sea dies. It's the same with our faith. If you are willing to be filled by God and to be poured out like a drink offering, like he says, you will experience the abundant, uh, the abundant life Jesus is talking about, and you will see the lives of others around you change. The only way we're going to do this is Jesus saying, come, come follow me. Come follow me. I'll make you fishers of men. And it's going public. And I want to uh, look at a couple passages. The main one this morning is, is Matthew 25. If you guys can open up your Bible, at Matthew 25, verse 31, or maybe you have this on your device, and um, whichever is, is best for you. But Matthew 25, it's a pretty insightful snapshot. I, to set this up, I don't know about you, but when I turn on the news and I look at current events and I look at biblical prophecy, I believe we're living in days where we're getting towards the latter days. I really do. I'm very convicted about that. Uh, there's a scripture that Israel won't surpass a generation and then the end will come. Well, since 47, they've been a nation. How long is that generation? Uh, that's a semantical question. It's hard to be dogmatic about how long that generation will be. But the reality is we're living in times where we're seeing fulfillment of prophecy, where we're living towards uh, the latter days. We really are. And uh, this passage of scripture talks about what it will look like when God sums up life as we know it. And there's a reckoning to be done and there's a sorting to be done because it is a reality. It is a real day. And it says in Matthew 25, 31, it says, When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep on his right hand and the goats on his left. And then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. And then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? And when did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes or clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison or go visit you? And the king will reply, truly I tell you, Whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. This is an amazing snapshot right here. We got this scene of judgment day, and it's what you might call the great separation, where there is, in fact, going to be a separation. And the analogy here is sheep and goats. The sheep are a part of his flock, and the goats who weren't part of his flock. They had a choice to. God loves them. He wants them to be. But for some reason, they said, thank you, but no thank you. And so this is the goat category and the sheep category. And and the Bible's really clear about the the, the futures of both. Right here, he's talking in this passage about the sheep. And so these are followers of Jesus. And the cool thing about these followers of Jesus is they did the right things. They did really good things. They did honorable things that honored God. And that's the beauty of it. But here's what's interesting. They're being rewarded for doing the right things. But at the same time, they are very confused. So they're getting their reward, which is great, but they are totally baffled and totally confused. And they do not understand what Jesus is telling them. And I think this is important because you and I, as followers of Jesus, can also try to do the right things and also be totally disconnected from what Jesus is talking about because it's what we see in the passage here. And that's the heart of what I want to talk to you about this morning that we can love God, try to do the right things, but really miss out on the heart of Jesus. And I think this is what should drive us. If we understand his heart, if we begin to, to, to discern these things, uh, I think we live differently. And yet, well-intended believers, a whole group of them here, who did great things and totally missed out, didn't even understand what Jesus was talking about. I think we can do the same thing. 
It says that they fed the hungry. They had hospitality for strangers. They looked after the sick. And they visited the prisoners. They did, in fact, minister to others. But when Jesus said, you did it to me, they're like, no, I think there's a big mistake here, Jesus. For sure, we never saw you. We never once saw you. Believe us, we never saw you. So we don't know what you're talking about. And so they're so confused that three times they say, when did we feed you, Jesus? We never fed you. We never saw you. When did we extend hospitality to you, Jesus? We, we never saw you. We never acknowledged you. And when did we visit you in prison? Jesus, you don't go to prison. You don't do anything bad. You don't do time, Jesus. You're, you're good. You don't sin. I, we don't even get this. We're disconnected. We're totally clueless from what you're saying, Jesus. And Jesus is saying, listen, guys, whenever you did this for them, you did it for me. And right there was this paradox moment where they're like, huh? One of those Scooby-Doo? Hmm? Like what? What? These are believers who love Jesus, who followed them their whole life and did the right things, but missed out completely on the heart of Jesus. On, on, on when you're doing them, aren't you seeing me? And they're saying, uh, no, in fact, we never saw you once. Isn't that interesting? Jesus is saying, you didn't see me when you were feeding people? You didn't see me when you were extending hospitality? You didn't see me? through the prison visitation ministry? No, not once. Wow. Jesus is like, okay, it's great you did the right things and you're getting this inheritance, but you're missing something really important. He's saying, guys, the only way we can really do the right things fully with the right motive is if if you're seeing what I'm seeing. If, if, if If you're seeing what I'm seeing, you do it with a completely different passion and a purpose and a different, a different modality of your life. You do it with a, you are driven to do it if you, if you see what I see. And you guys weren't seeing it the right way. Um, the, these guys were, they were not thinking like Jesus was, was. They were not ministering like Jesus did. And they certainly weren't seeing like Jesus saw. And... I don't know about you, but I I think we can do the same thing. We can wake up one day and go, wow, I didn't see that. I didn't see that. I did not see what Jesus is seeing. If you're a note taker this morning, I I believe the first thing God wants to speak to our heart about going public, it's not do it because you're supposed to do it. You're a Christian, get out there and do more stuff. No, it's not do more stuff and tell more people and go and start get cracking. That's not it. It comes out of, a, out of a love life with the living God who loved us before we loved him. And Jesus saying, thank you, you did the right thing. You are the sheep. You have eternity. I do love you, but you didn't see me? That's a bummer. Jesus is saying, it starts with seeing me. If you see me, it will drive everything if you see me in it. And he's saying, I want you to see me in it because whatever you do for the least of these, it's the same as doing it for me. We don't think that way. We don't see that way. And Jesus is saying, will you start seeing that way? Can you start, when we walk out of this room, can we start seeing differently, seeing the way Jesus is asking us to see? If you're a note taker, that's where going public begins. We need to see what Jesus sees. That's where it starts. If you and I don't see what Jesus sees, we'll do the wrong things or we'll do them with the wrong motive. Well intended, (laughs) A for effort, just like these guys. Hey, you did all the right things. This is great. But we will do it with the wrong intention and the wrong motive because we didn't see what Jesus sees. And that is so, so important to do it the way Jesus sees. Uh, Mother Teresa was asked, in fact, if if you ask many people, uh, certainly in the Catholic faith, uh, who, who do you think you know, affected the world more, uh, Mother Teresa or the Pope? Uh, most would say Mother Teresa. I mean, come on. She's just like rock star level. She's just amazing. She changed the world for you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of people, and she modeled it with her lifestyle. Mother Teresa is amazing. Uh, and, and she says this. She said, I see God in every human being. And when I wash the leper's wounds, I feel I am nursing the Lord himself. 
Is it not a beautiful experience? I believe that's how she can continue to do what she did as effectively. It wasn't just get out there and do. No, if, if the modality is get out there and do, then that's focusing on works and, and, and we're not just supposed to live by works, we're supposed to live by grace through faith. But if we have grace through faith, we in fact do works. But we do it for the right reason. It's driven from love, it's driven from grace, and it's driven from seeing what Jesus sees. Mother Teresa saw Jesus in people and I think the Lord is asking us to begin by starting to see Jesus in people. Now that might sound odd at first because it sounded odd to this group of believers too. It sounded odd. What do you mean seeing Jesus? They're not Jesus. And Jesus is like, but but listen, I'm watching you and I love you and I want you to represent me. And would you see me in them please? You know, human beings were made in the image of God. Scripture says that we're made in the image of God. And that's something that as you grow, you get more and more understanding. What does that mean? But We are made in the image of God. All people are made in the image of God. And God loves all. And God's trying to redeem all. And we have our own choices. And some choose God and some reject God. But God's like, I love you. I'm calling you. I'm extending my offer to you. It's a free gift of grace. Would you take it, please? I got a better hope and a future for you. Please come to me. And some are saying yes. And some are saying, no, I love my own life too much. I don't want to. I don't want to follow you. So there's this choice issue going on the whole time. At the same time, there's this extended offer out there. And as instruments of God's love, as sons and daughters, as children of God, he's saying, don't do this out of a works mentality. I want you to see me in them. Because if we, see, if we look at it that way, we're looking at it through a whole different paradigm. We have a whole different motivation And I believe Jesus did. Everywhere he went, he said he would look and he'd have compassion on the people. And he looks at every person and sees the potential in everybody. He sees the opportunity in every situation. I really believe that's so important for us. So important for us to see Jesus. He's saying, whatever you do to the least of them, you did to me. So I want to encourage you to start thinking a little different. Ask God, Lord, can I start seeing the way you see? Because I'm doing things too, and maybe I'm doing them with the wrong motive. Or maybe I'm doing them with the wrong intent. And all these people in the story, they missed out on this part. They simply did not see Jesus in the equation. He's asking us to see him in the equation. Um, the next part about how we reach out, it's interesting. You know, there's always new uh, methods and strategies. As a you know, pastor or church, they're sending us things all the time like, oh, here's a cool thing to reach your neighborhood or reach this. And there's all sorts of things. Uh, you know, this movie we talked about, Son of God, sounds like an amazing movie. There's going to be a study guide and all kinds of things. These, these are great resources and tools. I think they're all amazing. They're all great ways of reaching out. But when we think about the different ways and the methods, Paul explains a priceless method through which the world around us will know that Jesus is the real deal. And he gives us this really clear snapshot of what it is. And it's not really a a method. It's not really um, an angle. It's a spiritual reality. (laughs) And it's such a powerful one. Uh, It's Colossians 1.27. And uh, you don't have to turn there. I'll read it to you. But But it says, to them... God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery. In other words, God has a mystery. He wants the Gentiles, meaning the world, he wants the world to know this mystery. And here's how God chose to make the mystery known to the world. Here's God's method of of outreach, of going public. The mystery that God's gonna make known to the world is Christ in you, the hope of glory. What he's saying right here is, here's the way God is gonna disclose the mystery to the world. This is the way the world's gonna know. The world is gonna see Christ inside of you, the hope of glory. In other words, people are gonna see Jesus in you and they are gonna see that you have a hope and a future in him and it's gonna be evident to them that you have Jesus in you, don't you? Yeah, It's not me, but it is he who is in me. It's not who I am, it's whose I am. But yes, Christ in me, the hope of glory. And people will be like, huh. 
This is so, more, so much more powerful than all the things we can try to say or conjure up to reach out and methods and everything. Simply, simply, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Uh, that is explosive to me when I think about that. Um, the mystery is Christ in you. Uh, so many people are living without hope, but when you have Christ, your hope is locked. It's sure, it's secure. It's secure. Uh, it, it is locked in, it is guaranteed, it is secure, and you rest in that. And you have this peace in the Lord that people outside the faith don't have because God gives us that, that hope. He, he, he anchors that. And um, people need to see that in you and I before they hear anything from you and I. This is important because we were talking the other day, my nephew uh, came up to visit and we were just talking about uh, they were talking about people on their college campus that were holding out the billboards and the signs, you know, and telling people stuff in a megaphone, and how disconnected those people were with the reality of where people's lives were. And none of the people on the campus said, you know, you're right, mister, I want to be like you. <laughs> what does it take for me to join? I want, can I get a board and sit next to you with a bullhorn? I'm dying to do that. Nobody is relating to this. And in fact, they're thinking, if that's who God is, I don't know if I want to know him. I don't see any love in, I don't see anything modeled in that equation. Paul is saying, you know what it is? It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. And when people see that, they're like, now there's something going on right there and I'm intrigued. I don't know what that is, but I want to discover what it is. There must be something going on. What is it? And they discover if they get to talk to you and get to see your actions for a while, it's like, oh, it's Christ in you. Isn't that interesting? So Christ can actually be in people? Absolutely. He says, I stand at the door of your heart and I knock. And if you'll let me in, I will come in and I will never leave or forsake you. Have you done that yet? No, I'd never really thought about it. Well, (laughs) it's no time like the present. Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's what people are looking for. And so the second point this morning, if you're a note taker on this, is to To bring people to Jesus, we really need to bring Jesus to people. This is is how it really works. We we don't just bring people to Jesus. We try to get them to Jesus. Like We try to do that, but really the way is to bring Jesus to people because Jesus said, when he said go into all the world, he says, I will be with you. So Jesus goes with us. We're going to talk more about next week about the power of God's spirit among his people and the ministry of the Holy Spirit in this equation of going public in our city and how, how much the Holy Spirit wants to do in our lives. And we're going to break that down in detail next week. But what he's saying is, I want you to go. I have all authority. I'm telling you to go. Go public. I will be with you. So really, rather than bringing people to Jesus, we need to bring Jesus to people. And the way we do that is Christ in you, the hope of glory. You share God's love where you go and you bring Jesus to people. And that gets really explosive. Um, And they will see the love of Jesus in your life. I don't know about your story, but mine was very much like that. It wasn't about based on what I heard when I came to faith. It didn't start, oh, I heard something. It started by seeing Christ in people. Christ, the hope of glory. Paul says, the mystery will be revealed to the world, that Jesus is the Messiah, the Christ, the resurrected king of the universe. Here's the mystery, ready? Boom, Christ in you, the hope of glory. And that's what the world's gonna go, whoa, I get it now. That's what happened in my life. I can look back when I recount um, or recall uh, the people along the way in the journey that God put in my life that began to wake me up from my slumber, where I once was blind and I started to see, when I look at the process, and all of you guys have a process as well, even if you were raised in the faith, there had to be a day where you said, I'm giving my life to Jesus, because you don't come out of the room saying, I belong to Jesus. You, you, you know, little kids in the sandbox have their own nature, throwing sand and pulling toys away. So, you know, this is something that everyone, even if you're raised in a faith-based home, you still need to get to the point where you say, I'm not my own, I've been bought with a price. There is a day where you step over. There is a day where you give your life to the Lord. And for me, there were people that he put in my life that I was beginning to see Christ in them. And I was baffled. I didn't know what category to put that in. I, 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 didn't, I didn't know how to quantify that. What, what is going on here? One guy uh, was a mechanic in San Diego many years ago. 
this young man, his name was Brad, and he was a porter. All he did is clean the lot and he'd drive cars up to the customers. I'm working at a dealership as a mechanic and, you know, I'm thinking I was probably making four or five times the money he was. I had a house with a pool and jacuzzi. I had a race boat. I had a Corvette convertible, an old vintage. I had all these stuff in my life. I'm playing in rock bands with big Marshall stacks. And, and I'm like, look at this guy. He's, he's walking around singing songs all day. I mean, he's got a smile on his face. He's just got this, who is this guy? Where did he come from? What does he eat for breakfast, you know? I mean, he's walking around, just joy, singing, doing stuff. I'm like, dude, where, what, what's up with you? It's, it's the Lord. He means the Lord. So it's the Lord. You know, the Lord gives you joy. He gives you peace. And he, all the, just no matter what, it could be raining. He's out there cleaning up, pulling up cars for people. He's got the joy of the Lord. He's got everything I don't have. Wow. What is it? Why am I so captivated by something going on here? Why? For the same reason Paul said, Christ in you, the hope of glory. This is how the mystery gets revealed. And in my life, the mystery was unfolding before my eyes. It was just opening up right in front of me. Christ in him. Wow. He did this crazy thing, and I really, he, he kind of took it to the next level. All the mechanics at the end of the day would have to go in and wash up in front of this mirror, right? And so he took a scripture and put it right on the mirror, right where your face is. And it said, to whom much is given, much is required. And I remember at the end of the day trying to duck underneath that thing. I didn't want to see it because I wasn't ready for a scripture like that. But I knew the guy with Christ in him. I knew that. He's the one who put it up there. And I had enough respect. I wasn't going to take it down. (laughs) But the word doesn't return void. And it kept playing over and over and in my mind. It never went away. To whom much is given, much is required. I can almost hear God saying that to me regularly because this guy put it there. That's what scripture does. But it wasn't all of his words It was seeing Christ in him that I'm like, that is legit. It is a spiritual reality and I don't have it. That's what Brad taught me. Then I moved to LA, pursuing a record deal, still playing all the clubs and doing rock and roll, working at a dealership in North Hollywood. And then God brings this on fire little Salvadorian guy named Juanito. And, and Juanito, you know, he was kind of a trainee mechanic. He wasn't like a veteran, you know. He's kind of like taking the littler jobs and stuff like that. But he, he had this fire of God upon him, this presence of God that was so obvious. And I remember him going, going up to me all the time. He's like, listen, brother, if you think the Lord is going to do that, he's not going to do that. The Lord's got a plan for you, brother. You need to understand that. You need to, and I'm sitting there going, dude, what, where do you get all this conviction from? I mean, who, like God like puts an energizer and just turned you on or something. It's like, I mean, literally, this guy's like prophesying to my life. I'm like, who are you, you know? And I knew Christ is in him, the hope of glory. And I'm starting to connect some dots here. And so I'm like, God, you are calling me out. You are showing me things I can't deny any longer. So now I start taking steps into the faith, going, Jesus, I can trust you. I've seen what you've done in other people's lives. You can come by desperation or inspiration. It doesn't matter which one as long as you come. I was incredibly desperate for that and inspired for that. And I said, I'm walking to Jesus. And now I start trusting in Jesus. Well, this friend of mine who had moved to LA was looking for a place to live. He ended up staying on my couch for a little while. His name is Scott. And Scott is up at five in the morning. He gets up super early and he's got his face buried in the Bible. And I, I'm, I'd get out of my room and walk into the bathroom. I'm like, dude, sun's not even up. What are you doing? You didn't even have your coffee yet. You know, I'm a new believer. He's just buried in God's word. And it was like living with the apostle Paul on my couch. What am I seeing? Christ in you, the hope of glory. And all kinds of other things in this, in this guy's life that he modeled Jesus. I saw Jesus in him. All these people, I see Jesus in them. And I can't deny I'm seeing Jesus in them. And God is calling me deeper because I'm seeing Jesus in them. And then later on, as I'm stepping out in ministry for the first time, I meet, I meet Bjorn. And Bjorn is a guy who 
uh, is again exuding the life of Jesus. He just has the fire of God in his eyes and the love of God in his heart in a way that is so identifiable, you can't ignore it. And he's like, yeah, we're going to go feed the homeless down in Skid Row. You want to come? I'm like, yeah, sure, I guess, you know. This guy's like living for it. He's sharing the love. And you know what he did? He did see Jesus in people. And I might not have saw Jesus in people, but I knew that he saw Jesus in people and I was watching him and I learned from him how he's ministering and doing this stuff and it changed my life. I jumped into ministry, started serving God in all kinds of different ways. Why? Because I saw Christ in them, the hope of glory. Just the way people need to see Christ in us, the hope of glory. And so these people changed my life, changed my life. John 13, 35 says this. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. In other words, love is the way they will know. They will know by love. They will know by love. Not by all the words or all the challenge or all the black. They will know by love. Love is the vehicle, Jesus said. This is Jesus' words. The world will know by love. This is not a philosophy. This is not a a method. This is Jesus' words. The world will know by our love. And so the, the third point this morning is we got to love people to Jesus. We got to love them to Jesus. I'm going to speak to them and not push them. We need to love them to Jesus because God is love. And I think when you love people to Jesus, his love is undeniable. It's really undeniable. Um, and that's beautiful. And um, you guys have people in your life that are on your block, in your family, in your neighborhood, workplace, whatever, and they need the redemption of Jesus. Jesus wants to touch parts of their life. Maybe, maybe they're struggling. Maybe they're carrying weights in their life that God say, I didn't give you that. I'll, you know, come to me. If you're weary and have a heavy load, I'm going to give you rest. And there's people you know that are walking around with loads in their life. Jesus came. We looked at him last week. He came liberty, freedom for the captives, to, to release from oppression, Literally, people walking around that you know that are in levels of oppression, Jesus is like, yeah, I actually died for that. (laughs) I can take that away. I can exchange. I take away hearts of stone, give hearts of flesh. Behold, I make all things new. God is in the great exchange program. And he's done it in my life and he's doing it in your life and he wants to do it all over this city. He's like, will you let me make an exchange? Come to me, there's no other way. But if you come to me, I will make an exchange and the exchanges of God you will never regret. Never regret. Well, God wants you to be a communicator of that exchange. God wants you to be a minister of that great exchange. God wants you and I to partner with him through his love to to, to share and spread that redemption. Um, And there's so many things he wants to restore and redeem. Broken marriages, broken, you name it, relationships with unforgiveness and issues. He's like, I came for that. I am great at that. He's like, I'm I'm the best at that. Will you invite me in? And you and I get to partner with God in watching him do this great exchange. And there's nothing more powerful, nothing more valuable, nothing more purpose-filled in your life than partnering with God in this great exchange. See, the enemy has exchanged the truth for a lie. And we get to come back in and replace the lie for the truth. And there's the beauty because he comes to redeem that which was lost. And everything that was affected by the fall, Jesus is coming to restore. And that's what he does and that's what he wants to do. But he's always partnered with his people. He's always partnered with his children. And if you and I are willing to partner with God in this redemption process and finding what areas, what people, you know, uh, sometimes the, the greatest missionary trip you can ever go on is just walking across the room. Sometimes the greatest missionary journey you'll ever go on is just right down the block. You know, God is, I mean, we think around the world, and that's great, and we do great things around the world. They've shown that things are more effective when people in the culture minister to people in the culture who know the culture real well. That's what statistics show. So when people come to faith in China to minister to people in China, it works really great. But the reality is you have people on your block, on your workplace, in your family, that the greatest missionary journey you can go on is just, Walk on over there with the love of Jesus, with Christ in you. Um, last scripture I just want to share as the worship team comes up is Romans ten fourteen. It says, how then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? 
And how can they preach unless they are sent, as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news. Scripture is saying they won't know unless we go. They won't know unless we go. It doesn't happen a different way. God could have designed a different method, but this is saying if we don't go, they won't know. And so here we are back to the big G-O again. Jesus is saying go. He's saying go public. He's saying I will be with you. Uh, Share Christ in you. The hope, share your testimony, but go. And, And this scripture right here is saying how beautiful are the feet. This is interesting. It doesn't say how beautiful is the mouth that shares the good news. It says how beautiful are the feet. Do me a favor right now. Wiggle those toes of yours, would you? You got them wiggling? You guys feeling that? Those are some beautiful feet right there. Those are some powerful feet right there. I don't know if you know how powerful those feet are. But those feet right there have the capacity to change the world. If your feet will partner with Jesus and you're willing to go across the room, across the block, across the cubicle with those feet. Blessed are the feet that carry the gospel. And that's why Ephesians says with the full armor of God, talks about having your feet ready, ready to share the gospel. Gospel ready, not a gospel ready mouth, gospel ready feet. Isn't that interesting? Feet? Yes, feet. Those are some beautiful feet you have right there. They're also incredibly powerful. What we want to do is tune our ear. Next week, we'll talk more about the Holy Spirit's role in this, hearing from Him, and how the Spirit of God moves in our life to really affect the world around us. It's uh, really, really incredible. But right now, I want to, want to close in prayer, ask God to seal some of these things in our heart, and um, j- just really just take us to a new level. Uh, I believe God wants to use each of you to affect this city in a way you've never even acknowledged before. God wants to personally use you, literally. And it's not like, what do I have to do? It's just be who he made you to be, literally. It's let Christ in you be the hope of glory. Don't be ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God. And God doesn't give us a spirit of fear and timidity, but power, love, and a sound mind. Next week after our service, not only are we gonna talk about the Holy Spirit's role, we are gonna pray for the power of the Holy Spirit in the lives of each of us to empower us to become what he's calling us to be. If you're interested in that, I want you to start reading up on the Holy Spirit this weekend, on the Spirit's role in the book of Acts. Read what the Holy Spirit did to people and how the Holy Spirit changed people, not one time, but many times, to empower them to become what he's calling them to be. Because without the Holy Spirit, we're just winging it. It's not by strength or by might. It is by the power of my spirit. So I want you to read up, please, this week in the book of Acts of the Holy Spirit's role in the life of a believer. And if you're one that says, yes, I want that, that's what I want, well, then good, come up for prayer. If you're like, yeah, I might as well give it a shot. No, you're not, you don't really want that. You have not because you ask that. You have to want, you have to believe. Read the book of Acts on the Spirit's role this week. And if you really want that, I want to encourage you to come up for prayer next week uh, to be filled with the Spirit to empower you for what he's calling you to do. This has been a presentation of Valley Metro Church. To hear more messages or to support future podcasts, please visit valleymetrochurch.com.